Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Heidi Goodhart. I'm the manager of the Move Utah program at UDOT where we're focused on active, healthy, and connected communities. Today, we have a very exciting webinar for you, Don't Backpedal, How to Improve Walking and Biking in a Post-Pandemic World. So I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, introduce myself. Uh, I've been doing active transportation uh, planning in Utah for probably the last 12 years and I'm very kind of passionate about biking and walking and making our communities very active, healthy and um, wonderful places to live. So we're excited to bring you the Move Utah program um, that focuses on active transportation planning within local communities. We want to foster active, healthy and connected communities uh, through planning and implementation of biking and walking initiatives, programs and projects. Um, if some of you are not aware, we provide resources and technical assistance to communities across Utah, and we're bringing you this webinar series today as kind of a replacement for our Move Utah Summit. Um, I'd like to thank our partners whose collaborative efforts help make these webinars and our normal summit possible, as well as our programming throughout the year and our community outreach opportunities. So thank you to all of our very diverse partners. Um, if you're interested, you can learn more at our website at move.utah.gov. Um, here's our contact information, my cell phone, and um, kind of our, where you can find us on, on social. Uh, we'll be live streaming today's webinar on Facebook Live. And um, if you have any uh, you know, needs for observing the webinar in Spanish, um, you know, click on the world icon. We'll definitely drop um, some information in the chat as well, but feel free to find us on social um, as we're going into, into May. We'll have a lot of content for Bike Month, and we're really excited to have you. So I'm going to take a moment and just plug our past webinar series. Um, these are located on our website. You know, we've done some really cool topics um, in these series throughout the last few months. And, um, you know, these are really excellent opportunities to dive in and learn more about some of the, the inner workings of planning and some of the active transportation happenings across the state. So if you haven't tuned into our past webinars, please go to our website and see what offerings are there. And we're starting to offer those recordings in Spanish as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off today's webinar by introducing our moderator for today's panelists, uh, Stephanie Tomlin. Um, Stephanie Tomlin is a transportation planner at UDOT. She specializes in active transportation data analytics, multimodal planning, and the integration of big data into planning initiatives. And I can definitely attest to her kind of skill set and expertise in this area. Um, she's definitely she's very kind of uh, in in the trenches, as you say, uh, with our transportation funding and prioritization models. Um, and prior to her role over the last year at UDOT, um, she's been a consultant with Fair and Peers, and she holds a master's degree in bioregional planning from Utah State University, and sits as the board chair for Bike Utah. So uh, please join me in welcoming Stephanie Tomlin as our moderator for today's webinar. Thanks so much. Great, thanks so much, Heidi, for that introduction. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen because I would like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm very, very excited to introduce um, our panelists that will be presenting throughout the session. So we have uh, three panelists. The first is Bianca Lyon. Bianca is the Community and Partner Relations Director for the Utah Office of Tourism which is within the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. In her role, Bianca works with stakeholders and local tourism directors throughout the state to support um, UOT, uh, the Red Emerald Strategic Plan, and to promote a con uh, consumer-facing, forever mighty, responsible travel initiative. Before coming to work for the state, Bianca focused on tourism marketing for City Creek Center, and before that totaled nine years in Salt Lake City government working under Mayor Becker and the Salt Lake City Department of Airports. Next up, we have Rhett Ogden. Rhett um, is the Draper City Parks and Recreation Director. Um, he has always loved all things outdoors, including hiking, bike riding, and playing any type of sport. Growing up, he worked for American Fork City Recreation, doing anything they would let him help with. 
Then he graduated from Utah State University with a bachelor's degree in both parks and recreation management and a broadcast journalism. Brett's first job was with Provo City Parks and Recreation as the adult sport coordinator for one year. Then he became the first ever director of parks and recreation for Tremont City, where he remained for eight years. In 2008, he was hired by Draper City to be the Parks and Recreation Director and has worked in that position ever since. And then lastly, but not least, uh, we have Commissioner Hopes. Commissioner um, Casey Hopes has served since 2012 as the Commissioner of Carbon County and Price, Utah. He has been instrumental in spearheading active transportation opportunities and innovation in his community. Since the pandemic began, Price has seen an increase in trail usage and bike ridership. Commissioner Hopes aims to foster this new surge in recreation and um, active transit even after the end of this year. So as you can see, we have some really exciting um, representation here to talk about the, the topic at hand, which is continuing active transportation past um, the pandemic and continuing the surge that we've seen. We have representation all the way up from the state level um, down to a commission level and then down to a city level. So it should make for a really interesting discussion to have at the end. Just a couple housekeeping items to remember. Feel free at any point to add questions into the chat box or the Q&A pod. Um, we'll be checking both frequently as we go through the um, go through the presentation. We will hold questions until the end. Um, so we'll do some moderated questions that we have prepared and then you know, we'll start asking questions from the audience. So don't be shy, um, feel free and add those questions in the chat as they come up and we'll make sure that they get answered. But yeah, with that and with those introductions, I'm just going to start out with a very brief overview of some of considering the, um, considering the topic at, at hand, is the is the active transportation surge during the pandemic. I'm going to hopefully prove to you that, that that did happen and that we want to make sure that that continues because it has resulted in some healthier communities, more people just getting out and experiencing the trails in their area. So um, we, had, we have counters, active transportation counters at certain locations on multi-use trails throughout the state, honestly, and we were able to pull some of the data. And what you're seeing on this chart is the increase. The blue um, bar charts are from April of 2019, and the red are from April of 2020. And you, as you can see, just a massive spike in the counts of active transportation users on these facilities. You can see the, the, the Murdoch Canal Trail, Provo River Trail, and Jordan River Trail and the Maple, Mapleton Lateral Canal. Um, some of the highest increase was actually experienced at that Mapleton Lateral Canal Trail with over a 300% increase, but consistently across the board, you can see just a massive spike in the number of users on our system. And the nice thing about these trail counters is that they count anyone. Um, as in, you don't have to have an app or anything. It's just, if you go past the counter, it's going to count you. So it's interesting to see, you know, just these huge spikes and in increase knowing that it's, you know, it's counting basically every user. So next up is um, pedestrian Strava trips during COVID. So um, for those that might not know, Strava is an opt-in recreation app that uh, law, you can log into and record your trip um, that using an active transportation mode. So um, we tend to see it more represent Strava trips are more re representative of some of the more recreation focused um, people like that maybe ride their bike for a recreation purpose. Um, however, we do see there is also the option for people to record their commute trips if they want, but it's um, just primarily recreation. You can see on this graph, the light blue line on the top is representing 2020 numbers. The purple line is 2018 numbers and the red line is 2019. So similarly, you can see just the massive increase that we had saw um, basically this time last year in the, the active transportation pedestrian trips um, uh, recorded on Strava. Next up, we have the cycling trips that were recorded on Strava. 
And again, similar, very just, you know, that it's the same color scheme. So that light blue line is 2020 and then purple is 2018. And the red line is representing 2019 numbers. Again, just a, just a huge increase, you know, something like 60% increase um, year over year from, from uh, 2018 to 2020 in the usage of the Strava app for and recording cycling related trips. And this is for the entire state. And then lastly, I'll just end on this and then we'll get to hear from all of our esteemed panelists. Um, we did just want to note, you know, it's interesting because one of the kind of uh, active transportation modes that we actually saw go down was scooter utilization. So um, this chart, I understand there's a lot of numbers to look at, but the really what's um, outlined in that red box um, is something that we just wanted to draw your attention to, which is that for April and May of 2020, um, the scooter utilization basically just dropped off. You can see, you know, negative, um, a 98% decrease in, um, in usage for year over year. And then same for May, you can see a 70% decrease. Um, this, these numbers have actually started coming back up. We've heard from Lime, one of the scooter vendors that has been in this region. And uh, they noted that their trips are returning, they're about, they're entering about 80% of normal um, as in pre-pandemic numbers. But this is just an interesting thing to keep in mind is that we did see that those numbers go pretty low. And we think, you know, that's related to, there was a lot of emphasis at this, um, at this time last year about viral spread and not knowing if it was coming from surfaces. So obviously a shared mobility device uh, might cause some people Stephanie, I so apologize. I think you were muted for a moment. Yeah, so you're can back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. With that, I'm actually, this is the end of my presentation, and I'm going to pass it over um, to Bianca. All right. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully y'all can see me and then hopefully you can see my screen. Okay, um, hopefully uh, everyone can see my, my what I'm presenting. So my name is Bianca Lyon. I'm the Community and Partner Relations Director at the Utah Office of Tourism. And um, as my bio um, sort of indicated, um, our office is, is within the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. It used to be GOED, um, and now it's the Go uh, Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. And, um, and so I'm looking at, um, at this presentation today, both in terms of sort of the economic lens, but certainly uh, with respect to um, some of the pressure that some of our public lands have been under um, during the pandemic and as people have been um, uh, more outside and more active and more, more uh, uh, certainly more recreation focused as, um, as Stephanie's uh, slides indicated. So I'm excited to kind of show you a statewide perspective of some of the things that we're looking at, some of the um, trends that we're noticing and how we are moving forward um, in our Red Emerald strategic plan to address some of the um, issues and challenges. Uh, and certainly this all relates back to active transportation and, um, and outdoor recreation. I thought it would be helpful just to kind of keep in mind what the economic impact is to tourism in the state. These are from, uh, these numbers are from 2019 and sort of give a, a kind of a, 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 an indication of what our North Star now is. Because as we all know that the hospitality sector has been hit particularly hard during the pandemic. Um, but, but now this is sort of our goal. These were our 2019 numbers and we hope to reach those by, um, by 2023 or 2024. But it's, it is a longer term recovery and, um, and we're working towards that through our strategic plan, which I'll refer to in a moment. Um, just, uh, just to kind of indicate where, where we're going here is that we, we've had leisure and hospitality has been really affected uh, more than perhaps any other sector. And it's certainly something that we're really cautious of and watching um, with statewide occupancy, um, you know, very low compared to um, what we're used to seeing. Um, and that translates into lower um, statewide transient room tax collections, certainly statewide. And as you can see here, 
um, our, our urban partners are hit particularly hard. And this does all relate back to outdoor recreation and, and active transportation. So I, I look forward to getting to those. Um, but we're seeing a rebound um, in, in um, interest in travel to Utah in particular. And this is a graph that sort of demonstrates how Utah compares with our competitive neighbors when it comes to, um, to intent to travel and, and uh, interest in travel. And this was from April to January of this year um, over last year. And you can kind of get a sense of where we are um, compared to our, our neighbors. And so there's appetite for increased travel to Utah and outdoor recreation and active transportation. Um, of course, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that, that that has translated also into uh, increased traveler spending over our um, Western state neighbors and certainly um, nationwide, uh, we're sort of leading the pack there. Um, so, uh, you know, state uh, parks visitation and national park visitation were, uh, are something that we definitely were watching closely so that as we're kind of watching this sort of um, kind of nuanced uh, economic impact to our state with um, maybe some more rural destinations faring better than our urban ones, we're definitely seeing a little bit of a, a mixed bag when it comes to our state park visitation and national park visitation. So you can see that, um, you know, 33% increase um, year over year in state parks visitation and actually um, a decreased um, a a number of national park visitation. But it's important to note that um, our national parks were closed for a couple of months. And I think that also drove um, some interesting demand earlier in the pandemic, which uh, we, we saw earlier in the presentation. And I'll, I'll highlight here just a few of those numbers. Um, so right at that onset of the pandemic, you can see that, um, that you know, increase in trail use just skyrocketed. Um, and you know, I know that Rhett will speak to his experience in Draper, but we, were, we uh, experienced a 111% increase in trail use in Draper year over year. Um, a 90% increase in bike use in, in Ogden trail system and a 47% increase in Utah Valley trail use, um, which you know, indicates again, that pent up demand for outdoors and with, state par uh, with national parks being closed and with a lot of uncertainty about what was, uh, what was and wasn't available, certainly drove demand and increase to these areas. Um, but as the, as the year progressed, of course, um, national parks reopened and with that came record visitation to uh, parks such as Zion National Park, which received um, you know, over 520,000 uh, visitors for the month of September, which was a watermark for them. Um, we saw hunting and fishing license increase uh, revenue from uh, you know, January to November of 2020 over 2019. Um, increased in traffic uh, to Little Cottonwood Canyon over a seven day period, you can see 140% increase. And then um, an increase in off-road vehicle sales, which um, certainly uh, you know, is not active transportation, but something that, that we were watching closely as well, because we know that uh, that increased uh, interest in, in uh, motorized recreation is something that we uh, want to message appropriately when it comes to responsible visitation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, our Red Emerald strategic plan is sort of our, um, our kind of guiding star in our office uh, and was developed pre-pandemic to kind of help us prioritize um, how we operate as an office. And uh, with, with the monumental success of the Mighty Five campaign uh, in, back in 2015, we knew that uh, Utah was on the map as a destination. Uh, we knew that Utah was, uh, was uh, front of mind in visitors' minds and certainly those who prefer outdoor recreation. And so we developed the strategic plan to help us refine our strategy um, and so a couple of the points that are worth noting, I think, for this conversation is that we continue to be the, the, um, the uh, uh, you know, key uh, visit, visitor spot when it comes to the Mighty Five and continue that powerful branding. But we want to also prioritize the quality of visitation and not just the quantity of visitors and, and certainly um, those who, um, who want to spend more time in a destination to thoughtfully explore to uh, patronize businesses, to get on a bike and to, to thoughtfully visit uh, the areas uh, of our state are the ones that we definitely um, want to prioritize as much as, as possible. Uh, you know, distributing visitation throughout the state is also uh, a key uh, thing that we're, we're focused on, not just in terms of geographic visitation, but also in terms of time of day that folks are visiting 
the state or the time of year in which they're visiting. So it's also about uh, getting dark skies, um, tourism um, more front of mind of, of visitors and getting people to think about traveling in those shoulder seasons. And then of course, enabling that community led visitor readiness that we're, um, we're trying to promote to get communities to lead on the type of uh, destination that they want to be. So in, in terms of, of folks such as Carbon County, um, you know, that they have um, a very unique offering. And if, uh, you know, if, if uh, attracting more cycling events and activities and that type of visitor is something that they're interested in, that is where we can partner with local communities to leverage that message and to communicate that to visitors. Uh, I'm just gonna touch really briefly on our Forever Mighty initiative because I think it does play into uh, active transportation in, in a really uh, meaningful way. Um, we, you know, we certainly need Forever Mighty because as I mentioned before, you know, Utah is a, a recognizable place to visit now. The Mighty Five is a, a, a brand name that, that many folks recognize. And so um, it's important that we maintain our, our beautiful destinations, our communities, our, our local businesses are certainly part of that um, you know, for, for generations to come. And so Forever Mighty is essentially our uh, consumer facing uh, red emerald uh, messaging point to visitors. So um, it's something that I hope those of you on the call will start to see more and more of um, as, as this initiative grows. Um, and, and I'll speak to that a little bit more about ways that you'll uh, perhaps engage with that campaign that we will be uh, elevating and amplifying this year. Um, I would welcome everyone on this call to, to jump on the visitutah.com slash forever and acquaint yourself with some of that responsible travel messaging and um, understand how that interacts with uh, your relative spheres of influence uh, and, and the type of content that we as a state destination marketing organization are promoting. Um, so content that uh, helps people navigate the national parks in a thoughtful way. Um, yeah, the Go With a Guide video series that I would encourage you all to check out on our YouTube channel that encourages uh, visitors to have guided experiences um, in, in our natural areas that are not only um, uh, helpful to those businesses, but also um, keeping them safe, right? When, when they're experiencing uh, places that, that require, I think, um, some due diligence on, on safety side. Um, we're very active on social media and promoting um, Forever Mighty and responsible travel and safe travel through our social media channels. And um, I just wanted to mention a little quickly about how we're partnering with organizations through our Forever Mighty initiative to advance some of these goals. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were noticing that, you know, um, uh, motorized recreation is increasing just as any other form of outdoor recreation is increasing. Uh, both last year and certainly we're seeing that trend this year. So uh, this year we partnered with Tread Lightly uh, on a um, partnership um, and campaign through KSL uh, to promote responsible motorized vehicle um, exploration and travel. And it's uh, it's been a great partnership and um, again, somewhat related to active transportation, but just a, a way that we are uh, meaningfully engaging with a, a user group that um, that certainly uh, uh, needs um, to that, have that stewardship message. Um, we're really active on dark skies, as I mentioned before, and um, uh, we were celebrating uh, in April Dark Skies Month that was dec uh, declared by Governor Cox. And we were able to promote all of our dark sky uh, certified um, areas, which Utah is the leader in dark skies designated uh, areas. Um, to our whole state and um, using our local DMOs, our local destination marketing organizations to promote their respective dark sky areas. And, um, and this year we're also uh, gonna be partnering with the Utah Symphony on a, uh, statewide, uh, a statewide symphony tour and more information will be coming along about that. And uh, we're really excited to partner with, uh, with local communities throughout, um, throughout that uh, partnership and highlighting um, all of the different unique aspects of their communities, certainly tying in uh, those active, uh, active transportation and outdoor recreation uh, themes and opportunities into those, uh, those partnerships. And lastly, um, I just thought I would mention really quickly that we did receive uh, a million dollar grant from the Economic Development Administration to advance our Forever Mighty initiative uh, and share this, um, this thoughtful um, stewardship message to not only our, um, our local residents, but to regional travelers, um, both this year and next year. And um, you'll see more of that um, again in 2021 and 2022, um, helping um, educate visitors on how to travel responsibly, whether that's on a bike, 
uh, hiking um, or, or any type of uh, recreation that they might be interested in and just teaching those, um, those stewardship principles uh, through the course of that campaign. So that is a, an update from my end. I'm looking forward to um, hearing our, uh, my fellow panelists and um, engaging with, uh, with those who've attended today. So thanks for having me. Great, thanks so much, Bianca. So we'll actually now pass it over to Rhett. Rhett, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen and um, opening up your presentation, I'll just remind out everyone, feel free and add questions to the chat pod or the, um, or the Q and A box at any point um, for, and we can make sure we answer those questions at the end, but after um, I'll. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear and see me? I'm still not seeing the button to share my yes, screen. Can. So that should be um, on the bottom of your uh, of the, the bottom of your screen. There's a black ribbon that might pop up if you, as you yeah, kind coming. of hover over it. It's a green button. Yep, we can see your your screen now, right? Oh, and there's your presentation. Perfect. Okay. I apologize. How's that? Uh, um, thank you for giving me a few minutes. Looks good. It's, uh, it's nice to be with everybody to uh, discuss, I guess, a different perspective on the municipality level. Uh, Bianca, that was awesome to hear about some of the stuff that's going on on a statewide level. And, uh, hopefully a few things will, will, will be of interest of what we're doing in Draper. I know a lot of cities and municipalities are doing a lot of great things. If you know anything about Draper, we have, we've tried very hard to, to have trails that accommodate everybody. We've got a ton of, of uh, primitive trails. When we purchased Corner Canyon, when we purchased all of the backside of the Suncrest area, we've got over 5,000 miles in a conservation easement, or excuse me, 5,000 acres in you know, a conservation easement that'll be preserved forever. We've got people coming from all over the country and the, the world, actually, to try some of our, our mountain bike trails, which has been great for our city. So I um, so want to share a few things and also what we've done through the pandemic and after the pandemic to uh, try and get people moving in Draper. Um, this is just an overview of a lot of our trails. I'll, I'll zoom in here in just a minute. The, the purple ones are some of the trails that we've, we've been working on the last few years to really connect Draper. But more specifically, ones that we've done just in the last year to really connect some gaps. Um, what we've called the Phoebe and Ebenezer Brown Trail. These, were, these are paved trails that connect several gaps in some of our asphalt paved trails that, that really help people move. We're working on connecting some of the gaps right here, right now. So these connect to some other trails in Draper that really will connect you to, to most of the city. One thing that we felt proud that we've done, even though it's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a commuter trail, but it can get people from one destination to another, is working jointly with Lehigh City to connect the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. It's been quite a, a project. It, it goes through private property, through uh, mining territory, into other municipalities. You see it goes through Draper and then it leaves Draper and then comes back into Draper. So it's been quite a project, but we're, uh, we're happy that that's part of this constructed already, part of it's being constructed right now, but it connects Lehigh and Draper. And then once we get to the Lehigh, we can continue going. And uh, this last one I want to share with you, maybe you've heard about that, but we we connected our point of the mountain trail, which connects to Order Rockwell Trail, which connects into Sandy. So this little connection right here, where the purple begin, ends and the red begins, we had a little celebration last fall during the pandemic, but uh, it really is a neat accomplishment, and I, I felt that we needed to celebrate it. I, 
I ordered a really neat bronze plaque. I picked it up in my car and we asphalted it right into the trail. But really, you see this where the star is. That little connection right there, connecting in the the county line into Draper and uh, Lehigh. You can go from Sandy to Draper, Lehigh, and, uh, all through Utah County, up into Provo Canyon, and never leave an asphalted paved trail. So when you have opportunities like that, I think they're important to recognize we have a little program. But again, just is something we've been working for for a while. Finished our section, we're going to Lehigh to see what we can do to, to help them. And we finally made it happen this year. So it was, it was really neat. This is something I wanted to bring out that we did last fall as well. This is a uh, Mayor Walker and some of our city council members dedicating a bridge. And you might say, well, what's so important about a bridge? But this one bridge connects the Jordan River Trail to uh, the, the Draper TOD, which if, if you know the Draper over on the west side, west of I-15. That's where the eBay campus is. We've got several online stores or, or businesses like Thumbtack and uh, Boyer Companies. It's right next to the the front runner station, a bunch of high density housing, there's hotels there, there's a big plant. So really what this bridge did is it connected the Jordan River to this whole campus in Draper, right across the little bit of the Galena Canal, you see what's full of water, which in turn, we really hope that people can use their bike as as a commuter method to, to come to work or to, to where you live or for opportunities for recreation. They really, they really connected the Jordan River Trail, which runs along the Wasatch Front to, to Draper Campus. There's a nice sidewalk that goes right up to all these amenities. So never uh, discount what the, the value of a little bridge can do. It can a lot to our community and move people around. One of the things that we've done because of the pandemic, mostly I would say, we didn't have plans to do this until last year. Um, I'll show you some of the, the numbers in just a second. But this, in the in the highlighted blue area, is a an addition to a trailhead we're doing. To the north of here is our regular trailhead. I don't know if you see my cursor or not, but there's about 40 stalls in our Orson Smith trailhead. Last summer, we added these 18 stalls. And currently, we're constructing another 30 stalls. And this is just a one trailhead. We were seeing upwards of 250 cars at any time last summer parked on this trailhead. And of course, then people start complaining. The residents are happy. Um, city council's here from the constituents. So we've, we've really tried to increase parking to some of our trailheads. We've done this at, at several, several of them. This is uh, one of our counters. We bought a bunch of counters a few years ago from Eco Counter out of Europe. They were the only ones we could find that they can tell us if you're coming in or if you're leaving or if you're riding a bike or if you're walking. The counters are really awesome that way. They can give you some pretty great detail. But you can see on the chart right here, um, you know, it's, it's fairly stagnant. Part of that's because it's a little cold. But about mid March, we all know kind of what hit. And, what occurred and from there it just it just skyrocketed up until our, our hot point was in May. That was actually Memorial Day. But um, we had nearly 5,000 people go through this this trail on the Memorial Day itself. And it, it shows you what we were what we we're experiencing for the year coming in almost 400,000 people. So it's uh, it's awesome, but the pandemic and just people in general on their recreate have increased uses. So we're trying to keep up with the demand and increasing several of our trailheads. This is a project that we've decided to do that we just started this spring. It's an addition to parking to uh, Jordan River, Rotary Parking Draper. We're adding a bunch of parking down right by the Jordan River Trail. We're also adding uh, trailer parking so that People can bring their canoes or kayaks or paddle boards or whatever they choose. And in conjunction with Solid County, we're building a new boat launch that will give a lot greater access to the Jordan River that we've never had in Draper uh, when established boat launch. But, but that combined with the new parking is really 
really been a, a help to alleviate some of the pressure that we're seeing caused by the, the pandemic that we're just trying to keep up with. Well, there's another park, parking area on the trailhead that we're trying to improve. Uh, lastly, this is just one more section. We're really kind of focusing on, on gaps, but this highlighted yellow is a uh, it's property that we own, but the, our Fort Rockwell Trail is not actually constructed right there. So we're, we're really focusing on, on getting that finished right now. It, it, it's a lot harder than a lot of the portions of the trail. It requires a lot of retaining wall and uh, some intricate planning. But, but from this red, red here, where the Fort Rockwell ends by our park and where it picks up again on 123rd by the tracks crossing, that's where we're trying to connect right now. And you can use some of the sidewalks, but we're trying to get a all in a paved trail and really truly go, you know, from from go to north to San Diego, go to south to Lehigh, and, and never be on be the paved trail. Without a, a great focus in Draper to try and connect our community and connect it with other communities and make make trails a good transportation opportunity, but also a way to recreate, whether you're on a bike or not. Trails for biking only. Uh, we made trails for foot only. We made trails for hoofs. If you choose to ride your horse, so we, we really tried to include everybody and, and provide a way for everyone to recreate and to, to have a, a healthy lifestyle in Draper. Uh, that was the end of my presentation, and I'll turn it over to the next. Great. Thank you so much, Rhett. That was that was excellent. Good overview. If you wouldn't mind um, unsharing your screen, um, we can have we will pass the the time over to Commissioner Hopes for um, a quick discussion or presentation. Great. Thanks. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about our uh, Carbon County's experience. Um, appreciate Bianca with the state talking about the Red Emerald Initiative. Uh, when we talk about active tra transportation, especially, well, the way I, I see it in rural Utah, it's a little bit different than, than some of the trails you might see in uh, Salt Lake and Draper and, and, and different things. We don't have a lot of trails that go between neighborhoods. Um, a lot of the trails that we're, we're talking about are trailhead out uh, in the woods that, that goes to a scenic spot or, or things like that. Um, but we've always uh, been known kind of as the gas station on the way to Arches or to Lake Powell. And, and over the past few years working with the state, we've tried to change that. So I appreciate Bianca uh, mentioning the Red Emerald Initiative, try to get people to see some of those other things and experience some of the other great opportunities that Utah has to offer. Um, and and I, I wanna kind of focus my conversation a little bit about what we've done. So in 2019, just prior to the pandemic, we did a, a Destin destination development plan that helped us understand what our key assets were and, and what it is that would help us drive visitorship. Then the pandemic hit, right? Kind of as we were just starting to roll out um, with our destination development plan. Um, and in that plan, it identified um, what our current assets are, um, what what assets were lacking it, it, it laid out um, that we don't have very many walking trails. We have one in Price and one in Helper, and then two, well, actually at the time, there was only one other designated walking trail up on um, the Forest Service. So we saw that as, as something that we were lacking in our community. Um, of course, a lot of rural people don't need a hiking trail or a, a, a designated trail to, to say, this is where I'm gonna go. Um, but, but for visitors and, and for some people, that's, that's a must. They wanna know where they're going and, 
And, and that uh, master recreation plan identified that for us. And then it also identified the biking trails. And, and we have quite a few of those, but there were some places that we were lacking. And so we've been working on those. And then, like I said, the pandemic hit and, and we saw uh, in rural Utah, we saw a lot of visitors. Uh, I, re I remember early in the pandemic, I was out for a horse ride with my family on, on a multi-use trail. Um, and I had never seen as many people as I did that day on the Gordon Creek uh, waterfall trail. And as, as we would ride by people or, or pass them, uh, I, I just started asking, hey, where are you from? And, and there were a lot of visitors from all over the state, uh, mostly from up north, people that were getting away from the concentrated um, public areas and, and finding trails that were uh, kind of out of the way. Uh, so so we, we started to see a lot of increased use on our public lands. Um, the San Rafael Swell had people from California and uh, up north and it was Colorado. It was just, it was crazy how many people were, were visiting uh, different recreational opportunities, the, uh, the swell, Nine Mile Canyon and different things. So we, we, uh, we started trying to improve as part of the master uh, development plan. We, we tried to, throughout this last year, implement things that would help improve visitor, uh, visitorship and visitor experience. So we started adding, uh, we worked with the cities and we got up wayfinding signs so people could find their way through the community. They could find the bike trails and the hiking trails easier. Um, we also worked with uh, the BLM and, and we were able to put in improved signing at some of the recreational opportunities, both the Gordon Creek Trail and uh, we put in a, we're, we're in the process of putting in a, a trailhead there so people can park there and then, and then hike in. And we did the same thing in Nine Mile Canyon where there are some, some short hikes that people can take as they're touring through the canyon. And we, we, uh, we signed a lot of the, the assets or, or the opportunities in Nine Mile Canyon. Um, Uh, the other thing that we started working on this year is we re we're in the process of reorganizing our trails committee uh, be because of some of the things that we noticed. We saw that we had an opportunity to take a trails committee that has great members, but it, would, it had kind of an ebb and flow to it. If you, we would get a member of our trails committee that was very active and wanted, had a project they wanted to do. And so the, the trails committee would, would really go great guns for a little while. And then it would die down when, when that project was done. So we're in the process of working with uh, a federal agency to help us Kind of set some bylaws and and a formal organization and 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 develop a process so that uh, we can rank what our opportunities are and and where we're going to spend any funding that we have and and be able to prioritize the projects to start developing the assets that were identified in the destination development plan. Um, we also uh, changed a little bit of the way to, to provide funding for, for building our trails and, and working with uh, the Forest Service and BLM to provide signage. We're working with our uh, Tourism Tax Advisory Board and we've kind of changed the structure. It used to be that we have, we, we spend all of our money incentivizing events you know here's here's some money to put on this event or that event but we've changed our structure to where we're putting more in 
uh, uh, more of our funding into infrastructure to improve our visitorship, uh, our, excuse me, our visitor experience, um, like the wayfinding signs and, and putting and, and developing trails and, and different things. So, and, and, and we're starting to see success with that. Um, I'll take just a, just a minute and talk about some of the projects that we've worked on uh, since, since COVID hit. We, we, uh, we had a trail commi committee member that uh, he, he found an old photo of, of probably back in the early 1900s of some people standing under these great big circular rocks and they were perfectly round. And, and so he went out and found it. And then we worked with the BLM to, to uh, create a trail into this. And uh, BLM worked with us. We have uh, signs and everything's all in place. It's already identified and, and approved through the BLM and it's the Buried Forest hike. It's about a one mile hike that completes part of our um, asset building for the destination of development. Um, with, we, were, we were working with Price City to, to develop uh, bike lanes um, and, and we're supporting them in that. Uh, just a little bit before the pandemic hit, we worked with Price City and our trails committee to provide an active uh, bike program for the students at University of Utah Eastern. Um, there were quite a few foreign students or students that didn't have uh, any mode of transportation. And so that they, they had no real way to get to get around town. So we worked with the trails committee and uh, had some bikes donated as well as some new, new bikes that were purchased. And, and we created a, a bike checkout system for, for the students in University of uh, USU Eastern. Some of the bikes are just road bikes and some of the bikes are mountain bikes so that kid, some of the, the students can go up onto the mountain bike trails and, and enjoy those, which are not too far away from, from the university there. Uh, we're also working with uh, our, as a region, um, we're working with Emory County to uh, most tourists and most people don't understand where the, the county li lines are. And so we have some assets and Emory County has some assets. So we're, we're working on combining our trails with theirs to improve what we have to offer um, as people travel through to some of the Mighty Five or, or some of the other more well-known recreational opportunities. Um, we're working to highlight some, some of the other experiences that people can have on the way to those areas. Uh, we're also trying to connect our walking trails, both Price City and Wellington, or excuse me, Price City and Helper have walking trails. And um, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to either work with UDOT or BLM to try and connect those two trails, uh, both, both of which get used quite heavily, but it would be great to have a connector between the two. Um, uh, Commissioner Hope, so um, we're, we're running kind of short on time. I wanna make sure we have some time for Q and A. Do you have kind of a, a final wrap up or can we leave it at that? We'll leave it at that. Okay, that was great. Thank you. We had some, we're having some really great questions um, jump coming in. So yeah, so with that, um, we'll just, we'll go ahead and um, go into our Q&A session. So I'll lead things out quickly with, um, um, yeah, everyone can go ahead and turn cameras on. Um, and then let's go ahead and start out with a, with a Quick question. I, I we've gotten some answers actually to some of our moderated questions. So I want to start with kind of an interesting pivot, but I think one that will be um, fun to to jump into, which is UDOT recently updated um, our mission to enhance quality of life through transportation. 
This UDOT mission is built around the, the quality of life framework, which is, includes four pillars. One is better mobility, two is good health, three is connected communities, and four is strong economy. The question for the panelists is, how would you define a thriving community? And does this surge in active transportation play a part in that? So maybe let's start with, um, we'll go ahead and start with Rhett. Let's, um, so at kind of a city level and then we'll work up to the state level. Um, can you say the four pillars again, please? Yeah, the, the four pillars are um, better mobility, good health, connected communities, and strong economy. But we're worried, we're wondering how you would define a thriving community and how does this surge in active transportation play a part in that? I think, uh, at least from a Draper City perspective, those are four things that we uh, concentrated on for a while, and we see even a greater need since uh, the pandemic hit, and we've had such a, a surge. But we do have a, an active lifestyle in Draper. We we hear from our residents that they like to be outdoors. They like to to get out. They want to live close to a trailhead or or parks. We've got uh 40 43 parks in draper right now so uh, we feel that we have an active lifestyle we, we feel that our trails help promote that um, we feel that we're trying to connect the community and you can you can navigate throughout draper quite well on trails um you know in the last part i guess just answer you know in money magazine's list last year draper city was named the number six sixth best city in the whole country to live and at the top of the list that people said why was because of our parks and our trails and the lifestyle that it lets you live so i think those are all great great things that, that define a, a community that's a yeah great great examples there uh, commissioner hopes do you want to jump in on that and then bianca if you want to um finish out with your perspective from yeah, sure. Uh, I think a healthy or a, or a thriving community for for us in rural Utah is is one that, um, and it kind of leads back to to my presentation. Yes, we're trying to get some more visitors, and we're trying to capture some of the the, the people coming to the state, or even coming from up north from from the Wasatch Front passing through and get them to stop and visit but but the the real goal for us is to improve the lifestyle that we have because any asset that we build for our visitors is going to improve the quality of life for those that live here we all we already feel because we live in rural utah that we have a better life than or, or at least a more relaxed and, and, and comfortable life than those that live on the Wasatch Front. Our commute's the same every day, regardless of what happens, um, you know, the, tr the traffic. Uh, we really feel blessed to be able to live off of the Wasatch Front. So adding some of these, uh, some of this infrastructure really improves our quality of life. I would um, just echo the commissioner's well put. comments. Well um, okay, um, you know, from a statewide perspective, I'm really I'm just going to turn back and just say that it's it's really the community's vision uh, of uh, of a healthy community, right? It's it's their um, you know their values, the tourism economy they want, the active transportation network that they want, um, and and I think that's really. Um, you know that depends on the, the community itself but i think uh i think commissioner uh hopes said it really well that um you know you 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 know your communities i think can um you know be benefited by you know invest investment in uh infrastructure and trails and and uh, bike paths 
uh, for the sake of the visitor economy, but really what that means is a better quality of life for, for visitors and those are not mutually exclusive. Um, and you know, I, I'm really glad that the commissioner brought up the destination development plan that we, um, our office uh, worked uh, in partnership with uh, the Carbon County community to develop um, because that ensures that that community voice and vision is sort of part of that planning process so that, um, so that our communities, both rural and urban, can plan for the right futures that they want. So um, yeah, just kind of echoing that those are all great values that, you, that, that, that guide your organization and UDOT. And I would uh, just echo um, that that community-led uh, vision is really important. Great. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this one came from a, from an audience member. I think it's a really interesting one to touch on. So for each of you, if you can just offer a perspective from your you know respective uh, organization that you represent. So please discuss how recreational infrastructure, i.e. parks and trails, can be brought closer to the citizens of Utah and in their local communities, not only to tourists. Utah is, rap is growing rapidly, and as part of that, I believe we actually experience a decline in per-person trail infrastructure. There are statewide systems in place to ensure dense development, but the systems to ensure availability of trails, parks, and open space are lacking. Draper is a good example, but there are many more communities that have almost no trail infrastructure, especially in the western portion of Salt Lake County and some rural areas that we have heard about. So maybe, um, Bianca, let's just start with you from the state level, and then we'll kind of work backwards. So we'll go to Rhett and then, um, or sorry. Um, one uh, one thing that I think is worth mentioning in this conversation that I think uh, is, is definitely worth mentioning is that um, our sister organization is the Office of Outdoor Recreation, and they have a um, really robust program for, um, for communities who are looking to develop their, um, their outdoor infrastructure. And, um, and so I think, you know, working with, um, with communities to help identify those needs and those gaps, I think is really important. And then, um, you know, leveraging partnerships with organizations like, like Outdoor Recreation who can help identify the needs and then, um, and then seek um, the, the right tools and resources to help develop some of those. Because you're right, um, the, the question is a good one. Um, some communities maybe are, are better served by having more, more opportunities for outdoor recreation. I would just add from a municipal level, and specifically in Draper, and I appreciate the, the comment that Draper is a good example. We've really, we've really tried to bring parks and trails to our residents and not just for tourists. Um, it is a battle, it, it, it honestly is. And, and sometimes we hear the complaint that people are coming from all over the nation and the world to use some of our trails, but they're being paid for primarily on the, the backs of Draper residents for use of, of everyone. So we try and have that, we have to find that balance and make sure that we're taking care of our residents and, and it's not just a, a world playground, but I, I think just one point that uh, I really try to focus on is, is on the development end. Well before a trail or a park is constructed, we need to make sure we have good plans in place, whether it's a, a parks master plan or the trail and open space master plan. Make sure you, you know, you've got your city kind of outlined where we need trail, where we need parks. And then as things get developed or developers come in, work with the developers, make sure that, that they know the city's vision and goals. And, and sometimes you can even have requirements to have the developers help build the parks or trail segments. And, but they're really having a good plan and working be, before things are too late is a, is a good objective to, at least on a, a municipal level to, to really make things happen and bring things closer to the residents themselves. And I'll just agree with, with what was just said, it's important that you start creating that master plan, start developing um, what you want to be. I, I feel bad sometimes for the Wasatch Front because you've been growing so fast. I, I can't imagine what city planners are doing to try and make sure that trails get put in place. But if, if you have it in place in, in advance, it makes it a whole lot easier. And that's what we're trying to do here in rural. 
great. Well, we're we are at the top of the hour. Um, unfortunately, we need to we need to wrap up. Um, it's been such a great conversation. There were a couple of questions that we weren't able to answer that I reached out to those participants to leave an email address and we can follow up with you and get the, the question, your question answered. I did just want to quickly mention you know, that this webinar series is um, continuing. So coming up in May, we have a, here's the save the date for the next, uh, the next webinar, which is called Holy Spokes what historic funding for active transportation will do for Utah. So that's on Wednesday, May 19th, um, same time, so 11 to 12 p.m. You can go ahead, you can go to the Move Utah website and register for that. Should be a really great discussion about some of the new funding sources that we've seen come online recently for active transportation. Um, so with that, um, I believe we're we are, we are good to wrap up. So we really, really appreciate um, this great conversation. Panelists, you all did a fabulous job. Thank you for your time and for all participants. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, I think at that, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it and have a great rest of your day.